Welcome everybody to this Zoom session hosted by St. Aidan's Orthodox Church here in Manchester, where we look at some contemporary issues uh, and look at them in a formal debate. Uh, let me just quickly explain that this debate will be uh, someone speaking for the motion, then against, and then there will be a response from each speaker to each other, each of five minutes, and then there will be a summing up each of five minutes. The opening presentation will be for 10 minutes. Now, the debate proposal tonight is as follows. I'll read it twice. The gap between Orthodox Christianity and society in Britain is now so wide that words must give way to deeds if we are to make an impact on this culture for Christ. Now, both speakers are Orthodox, which is why we've specified Orthodox Christianity here. It's not an ecumenical question in its scope, but it is, of course, an ecumenical question uh, in terms of the involvement in the issues. I repeat, the gap between Orthodox Christianity and society in Britain is now so wide that words must give way to deeds if we are to make an impact on this culture for Christ. May the Lord bless our consideration, fill our hearts with his love and wisdom, and anoint with his most holy spirit, the two speakers, Phil and Chad here to speak this evening and welcome to all of you and to Malangath who has just joined us. So over to you Chad, uh, you will speak for the motion, uh, we could probably summarise that as emphasising actions uh, rather than words, but over to you Chad to make your presentation. You have 10 minutes, I will give you one minute warning at nine minutes, off you go. Good evening, fathers, brothers and sisters in Christ. I'd like to start by giving my position and the assumptions that I'm making. So I recognise that a gap does exist between Christianity and society in Britain, and in fact throughout the entire world. I acknowledge that this gap is so wide as to force us to consider how we behave within this hegemony. I assume that we are all engaged in mission, which is a call to all Christians in every time and place. Why is that? Well, in him, we live and move and have our being. St. Paul teaches the church in Athens, which we found in Acts. Nothing that we do and say should fall outside of our life in Christ. This is about our witness or our mission, what we do and what we say. Now, the key words that we find in the proposition are, well, Words is the first one, what we talk about or say. Deeds or works, which is our action, what we actually do. Impact, what has the more changing effect on those with whom we are engaged. And culture for Christ, that's to do with spreading the gospel. Okay, so I'll define the terms. Tonight, um, we are engaged in a process of theology. Uh, theology is made up from two Greek roots, the first as we know, it's theos, which means God, but it also means of God and about God, and logos, which means word, but it also means action. Christ is given the title logos by the church in St. John's Gospel, and it is clear from his gospel introduction that the divine logos is not only the words, but the actions of Christ, the eternal Son of God. So when we are talking about theology or talking theology we, or doing theology, we give simultaneous meaning to our deeds and our words, which in turn is reflected in the two pillars of our life in Christ, orthodoxy, orthopraxis, each of which is an expression of our theologia. We need to consider also what gospel means. Father Thomas Hopko of Blessed Memory tells us that the term gospel had a very particular cultural meaning in the first century Palestine and throughout the ancient world. The gospel was a proclamation by the king that a war had been won and that the peoples of the city where the proclamation was announced had been saved from their enemies and were now free once again. The people can return to their normal way of living in freedom, no longer under the yoke of the enemy. So when we proclaim the gospel, we are returning to the normal way that God meant for us to live our lives, our actions, not in the way that we have been forced to live before under the dictatorship of the enemy and under the dictatorship of the enemy, which for us would mean the world, the flesh, the devil, sin, passions, death, etc. 
So what is this way of life that the gospel frees us to live? It is unchanging. It is how God has meant humans to live from the beginning, and at which we immediately, of course, failed. How we behave as Orthodox Christians, as we follow our path towards him and for Christ, remains unchanging throughout the centuries. Why? Because authentic Orthodox Christianity is always counter-hegemonic. Whether we live in the first century Palestine, fourth century Rome, 21st century Britain, how we behave, our actions, how we live out our lives in the gospel, which in effect are our words and our works and our deeds, especially towards others, is informed by our faith in Christ. And as we grow in him, become more the expressions of the Holy Spirit working in and through us, as we are changed by him into his image and likeness. What we say is almost neither here nor there. As the worldly colloquialisms say, words are cheap, actions speak louder than words, he's all talk and no do. So it's my contention, as a proposal of this debate, that words must always and forever follow deeds or works, not exclude them, but are essentially subordinate to them. Okay, so we have some examples from the Gospels. Christ tells us that to be his followers, we should do as he does. Deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me, Matthew has Jesus saying in Matthew. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. The greater works than these, he will also do. That's from St. John. These are actions, not words. And the prime example of how we relate to others in terms of mission and the gospel can be found how in, in the story told us in John's gospel, how Jesus heals the man born blind. Now, we can find that account in John 9, 1 to 41, but it's too long to read tonight. So I'll give you the gist. <laughs> so we have Jesus. He sees the man in need of healing. He tells his disciples that he must heal the man so that God is revealed to him. Jesus does action to heal the man. He makes mud, he puts it on his eyes, he washes his off. The man is healed. Well, what happens next? What happened to you? The man is asked. I was healed, he said. Who healed you? I don't know. He was a prophet. The man acknowledges the healing himself, not by what anybody else tells him. His parents say, he's of age, he can speak for himself. So the man himself who is healed recognises that that is done to him and that the one thing that has done to, have been done to him is a work and that he has changed. Finally, he encounters Christ who asks him, you ask him if he knows who he is, and the man says, well, who is the son of God? The man asks, and Jesus says, it's me. At that point, the man is converted. So we have a series of events, which is a good model for us in our dealings with others in terms of mission. Recognize the need. Act. From the action comes belief. Then we use words. Who is Jesus? Who is Christ? And then conversion comes. Examples from the epistle, St. James says, what does it profit to my brethren, a man, if a man says he has faith but has not works, can his faith save him? Your brother or sister is ill-clad and in lack of daily food, and one of you says to him, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving him the things needed for the body, what does it profit? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. Go in peace, be warmed and filled. Jesus loves you. Christ died for you on the cross. Yes, yes, yes. It's what you do first that counts. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven, we have in Matthew. Now, of course, Jesus is addressing those who use empty words in prayer, but without living a life in him. But the clue to how God wants us to behave is there, nevertheless. He who does the will of my Father. Well, what is the will of the Father? In a parable, Jesus tells us, Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, O blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. And the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? 
And when did we see you sick or in prison or visit you? And the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brethren, you did it to me. That's in Matthew. And lastly, from our tradition. It may be good at this point to focus on a very new saint, one who was martyred less than 100 years ago, uh, who lived in a very similar social situation to us, although, of course, last century, Mother Maria of Paris, who said, <clears throat> Our God-given freedom, freedom, what we said about the gospel earlier, freedom calls us to activity and struggle. The way to God lies to the love of people. A love of people is an action. It's not an airy-fairy emotion. It is something which we do. We love people. The way to God lies to the love of people. At the last judgment, I shall be asked, did I feed the hungry, clothe the naked, visit the sick and the prisoners? That is all I shall be asked. Not... Right, nine minutes, Chad. You've got one minute left. Not... Did I give them beautiful words from fine and noble thoughts? Or, as St. Francis of Assisi, of the Western saint, said, apparently, preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, you can even use words. Thank you. Thank you, Chad. So, little pause there. Uh, as I introduce now, I should have said a little more about you, Chad, your subdeacon and missioner in our new mission in Hibbold, uh, St. Hibbold in Scunthorpe. And Phil, Phil Williams now is a um, believer and member of St. Michael's Church in Audley and Dresden near Stoke. And um, I've spoken before here, as indeed as Chad. So, Phil, it's over to you now for your 10 minute presentation on the importance of the gospel message and words uh, such that we do not uh, neglect those. So over to you, Phil, now. Okay, before you start the um, timer, Father Gregory, did, are we going to show, I, I did a few little slide things to accompany yeah, it. I've got, I've got them. You can also share, this. I've not started the timer yet. You can oh. also share your screen. I found if I the do, uh, so, If I do that, it's just, I mean... Yeah, if you uh, try and share, try and do it experimentally now by sharing yeah, yeah. your slide. If not, I will share it because I've got it here on my screen as well. Right, you can people see that? It. Right, that's good. Is everybody yep. seeing that? Yes. Can yep. somebody okay. say yes? They can see it. <laughs> yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. Great. It's not going to be death by PowerPoint, but uh, <laughs> I do want to have a few words on the screen. Right. Okay, well, words I'm all action. I'm going to start your time now, Phil. Okay, okay thank you, Father Gregory. Okay, um, so I'm opposing the motion, and you could ask, well, why? What's there to oppose? Surely what uh, Chad's um, shared with us is uh, worthy of all ac acceptation. I certainly found a lot of it resonating with me. But I do want to strike a, um, a chord of not contradicting Chad, but saying, hang on a minute words are important and I've got a nice illustration here because go out and preach the gospel use words if necessary whilst was um, attributed to St Francis of Assisi he didn't actually say it so I'm starting with some <laughs> things where things that are often said but never actually said um, apart from the middle one here acquire the, the spirit of peace and thousands around you will be saved St Seraphim of Salov said that he did say it but there are other quotes about um how we are to be how we are to act that weren't actually said by those to whom they've been attributed um there's a quote mis mis uh, misattributed to john wesley along similar lines i set myself on fire and people come to watch me burn <laughs> say it uh, just he didn't actually say one of his most frequently quoted misquotes which was do all the good you can by all the means you can in all the ways you can in all the places you can at all the times you can to all the people you can as long as you ever as ever you can you know nobody would disagree with that again he didn't actually say it so words are important and uh, you know precision in what we say is important as well um i think we're setting up a if you're not careful setting up a false dichotomy Words or actions, should it be words and actions or words in action? I've just got a couple of um, scriptures to quote at you. Um, 
the former account I made of Theophilus, everybody knows this verse from the beginning of Acts, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. And the following verse goes on. After he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. Difficult to do that without speaking, without words as well as deeds. It's both and, not either or. I think we'd all agree with that. I've got some examples from Pauline uh, mission here. This is the Apostle Paul. He was reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. Interesting, he withdrew there. He, he faced opposition. He withdrew to this gymnasium or, or whatever it was, this public space, which was used as a school. And uh, he continued lecturing, as it were, teaching for two years. And it says, even though he's withdrawn, and it probably a little bit of hyperbole here, but it says, all, that, all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord both Jews and Greeks. Then at the end of Acts, right at the end, we've got Paul throughout two whole years, again, considerable period of time, in his own rented house, received all who came to him preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no one forbidding him. So we're talking, I mean, very much we tend to think of Acts as lots of action, lots of miracles, all sorts of things going on. But there's these periods, substantial periods, two years in these cases of, of solid teaching and exposition of um, teaching about the faith to Jews and Greeks, interestingly, both to Jews and Gentiles. Now, OK, orthodoxy, orthopraxy, that's been mentioned, right belief, right worship, right behaviour, again, both and. It's interesting when we look at early church catechesis, and I'm going to draw on a, an Anabaptist theologian here, not an orthodox one, but who, who has some interesting insights, I believe, a chap called Alan Crider. And he points out there was a lengthy process of catechesis, and he's compared all the extant, as far as I can tell, examples of... Um, and forms of catechesis in the early church at, at some length. Um, processes, Father Greg, Greg could tell us more about this, process lasted up to two years. Interesting. Uh, he argues that whilst doctrinal instruction had a role in this, the emphasis lay on transformed behaviour and what he calls habitus. And he goes on to define that, which is embodied in his words in action. And he draws on the work of a French sociologist, Pierre Bordeaux. And he, I mean, he describes it as reflexive bodily behaviour, action. But it becomes habitual. Uh, he argues that the early church gained converts not by winning arguments, although apologia, um, defence of the faith, did play a role. Instead, they grew because their habitual behaviour, rooted in patience, he's got a big thing about patience and endurance um, in the early church, was distinctive and intriguing. Pagans, they wanted easy answers, household gods, give me a Ferrari, that sort of thing. Um, when challenged about their ideas, Christians pointed to their actions. They believed that their habitus, their embodied behaviour was eloquent. Their behaviour said what they believed, it was an enactment of their message. So once they were admitted through baptism, after a lengthy process of catechesis, believers were to develop godly perspectives and behaviour through preaching and instruction, but also through participation, through doing uh, in worship, particularly prayer and the Eucharist. So, so far, you think, well, hang on, I'm saying the same things as Chad here. I am, but there's a, a particular emphasis I want to bring out, which is the emphasis about the words, what we say, what we preach, what we teach. And I'm a great believer as a relative, well, a newbie to orthodoxy that catechesis is vital. There's a great lack of catechesis, I think, within orthodoxy, which needs to be rectified. So it's words and actions, words in action, words enacted. Okay, as we all know, the incarnation, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. As Christians, we follow the one who was the word made flesh, fully human, fully divine, the God man. Now, I come from an evangelical background and as a good evangelical Protestant for over 20 years, I was keen to stress the gospel message. But I also understood, of course, that Christ himself is the message. He is the gospel. He's the embodiment of, uh, of what it's all about, what we are proclaiming. Now, Protestantism, yeah. It can be characterised, and indeed I would say caricatured to a certain extent, as being very wordy, 
can be seen it's all about preaching, all about Bible study, all about giving intellectual assent to doctrinal propositions. It can be. I would say it doesn't always fall into that trap, but uh, you know that's how it's often seen. Whereas the more sacramental traditions, such as Roman Catholicism and Orthodoxy, for their differences, they're sometimes described as being more incarnational, emphasis on the physical, on the Eucharist, rhetoric, shrines, iconography, etc., which some Protestants would take issue with and see as works salvation. And of course, you've got this big dichotomy within Western Christianity, faith versus works, you know, Paul's preaching about faith as opposed to the epistle of James, you know, how do you reconcile the two? Now, and also, uh, I would say, uh, sometimes a, a confusion between the word of God and God the word. I won't go into that because we haven't got time. I have to say my particular plan of Evangelicalism did distinguish between that, but there could be a blurring at times, you know, Father, Son and Holy Scripture, as it were, and uh, some extreme emphases at times could come in, particularly from the States. I um, haven't got any Americans here, have we? <laughs> so what we're looking at, though, is action and pro proclamation, both together in an incarnational way. Uh, we haven't got time to go into all the um, various controversies since the Reformation, but it's should be clear by now that I'm advocating a both and position when it comes to the relation between proclamation and action uh, and much else besides. But there's a key thing here though, if, if we make it all about actions, all about good deeds, all about good works, which is great to bring that on, um, the fact is the Christian faith does not have a mon monopoly on good deeds. We don't. So, you, you know, you can do all these good things without necessarily uh, 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 signing up, as it were, to a... a Thank you. This is the one-minute warning you've got. Okay, one-minute one warning, being said. Yeah, I'll just check out a few little controversial things. Chat with a Quaker this weekend, saying you don't need creeds, you don't need teaching, you don't need doctrine, just about how you behave. Don't hold parties and lie about you afterwards. <clears throat> um, so wh where does that leave us? Um, I've heard it said that the gospel's been so successful in Scandinavia, and it's got this lovely benign country with lots of welfare state and flat pack furniture god's been worked out of the equation because everybody treats each other nicely and fairly and squarely is that really what we're looking at i mean that's a, a character of course if you just make it all about works and what distinguishes uh, what we've got to offer the world what we're offering is christ so good works bring them on proclamation bring it on words in action, words embodied in acting, bring it all on. We need works, we need words, we need both. So let's avoid the false dichotomy and opposition between faith and works. And through prayer, worship, practical service, let's embody the gospel and minister Christ to those around us in both what we do and what we say. Amen. All right. Right, thank you. Okay, so thank you very much indeed, Phil. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got two contrasting but connected, nonetheless, presentations there. I'm now going to go over to uh, Chad again, Subdeacon Chad from uh, Mission of St. Hibbold in Scunthorpe, who will now for five minutes uh, respond to some of the points that you've made, Phil, and perhaps introduce a few more of his own. So starting now, Chad, thank you. Mm. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank Phil and Please don't think I've been cheeky. <laughs> I don't know you very well, but uh, in good faith, I'd like to say thank you for reinforcing my proposition. <laughs> I think you were speaking for me for most of that. Um, no, seriously, though, um, I absolutely agree with what you said in terms of we must not we must not create a false dichotomy. Otherwise, we run the danger of becoming extreme in the ext most extreme situation, becoming um communists we get rid of god and we say we can bring all of humanity's perfection by ourselves by how we work and that of course we know is not true i'd like to um just re-establish what my contention is uh that um words are very important but must always and forever follow deeds or works not the other way around we don't exclude words Words are less important than how we work with people. It's interesting. Um, but uh, I quite liked the way you started where I finished <laughs> with the so-called words of St. Francis of Assisi. Um, I, 
um, I was actually completely aware that actually it's a false um, attribution to St Francis. Nevertheless, um, I don't think it matters, quite frankly, who said these things, whether they're misquotes, doesn't matter. If, if, um, if the words speak a truth, then the words still hold what they're trying to communicate. We know there is discussion, for example, about the authorship of some of the epistles in the New Testament. It doesn't actually matter whether something is written from St. Paul himself or by the school of St. Paul. It doesn't matter. What's in matter is what that imparts. Um, so I would have a slight issue with that. Um, yes, no dichotomy. Absolutely. We are whole. That In the way that we are whole creations, what we do has to have a a holistic nature we have to be words and deeds but i would say deeds come first i was very interested also by what you said about habitus i'm um in another hat i wear i'm a qualified behavior therapist and uh from a long time ago and so i worked very closely with behavior that challenges and one of the ways that you bring about change in those people uh, with their obviously with their help and consent is you try to encourage new positive behaviors you relearn how to live one's life in a particular way and I think that is indeed what we do with Christianity it during a, a catechesis which I agree should be longer it's important that we don't only say the words of our belief as orthodox Christians but we do the deeds these two things are inextricably linked People see their works first, I would suggest. The words come secondary, as in the gospel story of Jesus healing the man who was born blind. I've got one and a half minutes left, but I don't you think have, I've got anything have, else. Yeah, you have got one. I don't think I've got anything else to say, actually. I enjoyed Philip's uh, presentation very much. And actually, I think <laughs> if we're in a, in, a pub, in a pub together with a couple of points each, we'd agree, actually, that we're from a very similar position. Yeah. OK, thanks very much indeed, Chad. Uh, so back over to you, Phil, from, yeah, um, uh, representing Stoke. Well, well from so via South Wales originally. Uh, yeah. via, via South Wales. <laughs> I don't have a Stokey accent. I do, I do, I do, I do, I do eat oak guess that, Phil, yeah. yeah I do eat oak cake. Um, <laughs> Right, five minutes. Yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting. I think when, when I was presented with this as a subject, I thought, hang on, you know, it's going to be a lot of agreement here. I, I'm going to be countering something which, you know, I have a lot of sympathy with um, in terms of what Chad and, uh, said and how he's outlined it. The, the thing I would take issue with is the idea that he said, and I jotted it down, was it doesn't matter what we say. I think it does. And I'm not saying that so that, uh, you know, this evangelically sound, you know, six points of this and that and the other. And that. But, you know, Paul himself says, you know, if the trumpet gives an unclear sound, who shall rally for battle? You know, it's, you know, it's there, you know, and uh, Greek is very precise, isn't it? And, uh, you know, we're, and yes, there's been all these the councils and things they spent ages mulling over all these words and and falling out with one another. And, you know, what? You know, the Quaker I met, you know, she was saying, well, you know, if you start overlaying everything with creeds and doctrines and things, you start fighting with another, well, you know, we just need to be all nice and lovely to each other and the world will be a better place. Now, on, on one level, I can see what she's getting at, but I'm thinking, well, hang on, hang on, is that right? I'll give you an instance. Um, I was discussing um, um, Tennyson's poem, Crossing the Bar, some of you will know, um, with a chap who's lost his faith, but he's, he comes from a Plymouth Brethren background, evangelical Protestant background. And he said, oh, you know, it ends, you know, I hope to see my pilot's face when I had crossed the bar. And he said, oh, the pilot there um, is God, not Jesus. And I said, well, hang on, in Christian theology, Jesus is God. I mean, and this is somebody who comes from an impeccably evangelical background, even though he's, he's not a believer anymore. He's, he's fallen away, as it were. But I was just thinking, what the heck? You know, this guy has probably spent 30, 40 years in a Brethren Assembly, and he's confused on that issue. Um, and, you know, I saw Father Gregory go, ah. And I think, you know, if we do say words aren't important, what do we end up with? You know, uh, you know, do we end up like, Mm -hmm. Chad said communism, 
you know, Quakerism. I've got a lot of time for Quakers, a lot of my friends are Quakers, but what's actually there? You know, it's, uh, I, I went to a, a Quaker retreat once and there was a Catholic lady there. She turned around at the end. She said, I thought Quakers were supposed to be Christians. I've not heard Christ mentioned once all day long. And, um, you know, they were doing Tai Chi, they were doing lace making, they were doing all sorts of activities. No mention at all of gospel, no mention at all of Christ. And I think what this is where I think there's a, a crucial thing. I, I, I can see why Chad's saying, the works then the proclamation one minute, Bill. One minute. Yep. One okay minute. thanks we see that we see that but we if we are not careful we lose you know it is about the word the living word the logos you know if you take that out of the con the equation and i'm not saying chad's saying that we do what have we got left nothing right you words know. are important the word right now chad has got five minutes to sum up you will have five minutes to sum up phil and then we will have a discussion amongst ourselves with the lord right chad <laughs> five minutes to sum up yeah um if you say we get rid of the words then of course we aren't christians anymore so i'd like to rebut that that statement that you just I don't say I've not said that at all. <laughs> <laughs> I know you didn't, but I'm just clarify the point you made then, Chad. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, so talking about words and versus deeds, it uh, brings to mind the gospel story again, where uh, Jesus tells a story of um a man being asked to go to his father's vineyard and does he go or does he not and one of the sons says i'm not going and he goes and the other son says yes father i will go but he doesn't go who does the will of the father best one so i would suggest that and this is a bit tricky in five minutes <laughs> when we behave in a Christian way, out of love for our brothers and sisters, we are acting for Christ. Christ is acting through us, whether sometimes we know it or whether we don't. That we are actually motivated to do these works is, by and large, because of our faith in him, not in spite of it, which is why communism doesn't work, and which is why words must follow deeds we can't do without them but when we're engaging with people in the world we have to start from where they can see us and they see us doing before they hear us saying i would say that is that is the that is you made the summing up of, of my position in this matter thank you yeah, and if I may, with the meeting's permission, what I took from you, Chad, is precisely that. And mm. I think that it, where, where there might be some divergence between you and Phil, Phil, you may want to pick this up in the last part of your five minutes. It seems to me that Chad is saying that the deeds come before the words. It's a temporal succession. Uh, it's not a hard and fast rule, but that appears to be what he's saying. Is that correct, Chad? That's yes. what he's saying? Yes. Right, yes. Over to you, Phil. Five minutes to sum up. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll try and focus on that one issue. I mean, I, one could argue, I mean, I agree with the um, original proposition that um, societies move so far away from Orthodox Christianity, or indeed any form of Christianity. People don't know the stories, people don't know the um, parables, it, it, you know, it's not part of the culture anymore. Uh, I remember being in, in the Louvre in Paris, you know, walking through the gallery there, Renaissance painting of um, David and Goliath and two Americans looking at him and said, hey, look, it's a little guy beating up a big guy. They didn't even know it was David and Goliath. And these were from the States, you know, you'd imagine Bible Belt, you'd, you'd think they, <laughs> they'd know that. So all these things have gone from our, our culture. So, But I would say because of that, there is more need for words and teaching. And if I can use myself as an example, I mean, Father Gregory craved this indulgence. I mean, he, he's probably pulled a lot of his hair out with me. I mean, it took me about 25 years. I've got no hair left, look. Yeah, yeah, no yeah, hair yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all gone, he's pulled it all out. It took me 25 years um, to convert to orthodoxy. Um, and why? And it needed a lot of teaching, a lot of explanation, 
yeah, I kind of got it the first time I, I, I went to an Orthodox service, but it took me 25 years to work it all out and process it. And now, OK, and that's somebody who's coming from a, another Christian background. How much more time is it going to take with people who are sort of haven't got that background, haven't got that um, heritage? And, and, you know, what, what, are we, what kind of deeds are we talking about? Um, what deeds can we do that are different to what other people do? And I think you know there is there's a case for doing deeds and, and good stuff just because it's a good thing to do. I remember a, a Protestant evangelist saying once, I didn't agree with him, saying, you know, why lend your neighbor your lawnmower if you don't tell him that you're doing it out of your love for Christ? And I thought, what a load of rubbish. You're just lending him your lawnmower um, because you love your neighbor. You know, you don't stick a tract on it or um, spray some kind of gospel message on it. Um, but and I know what he was getting at, but I just thought there was a, it sounded a bit dislocated to me. But I do think that as, as we move away from a Christian culture, we've got to find new ways of doing this. We do need that essential emphasis on explanation, on proclamation, on words, not to exclusion of deeds, certainly not. Um, and I... I agree people have to see it come and see that's what philip the apostle said come and see and i agree with all of that but uh, somehow we have to find ways of articulating what we believe and putting that across in a way that people can understand we've got a heck of a lot of groundwork to do and hard work to do to bring that about that's basically all i've got to say Brilliant. Thank you, both of you. Uh, we're right on schedule. We've got 20 minutes or so, maybe a little more, with the indulgence of the meeting, for us to have a discussion on the issues that both of you have raised, and perhaps issues of our own. So it's to the floor now, to anyone who wishes to speak, in which case just wave your hand or stick it out. Oh, we've got one there already. Malangus, set the ball rolling, please. Is this a comment or a question? This is a, a comment. Okay. I'll just, I'll just lower my hand, otherwise I shall forget to do it. I see um, that hand. You see, since last since last time, I've learned how to put my hand up. <laughs> 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 um, I think that it's about building a relationship with people first, because if you don't have a relationship with somebody, they're not going to hear what you're saying. Equally, we have to use words that people understand. If we start using all sorts of technical Christian, um, you know, words from church, I mean, salvation, that's got so many meanings for different people. We actually have to explain it or use words that convey actually what we mean. And sometimes that takes more words than just one you know we have all words have baggage and and so it's it's very important to speak to people in a language that they will understand paul went to places where people were debating he went to the synagogues he went to the public spaces where pagans debated these subjects they were already in the arena of talking theology he wasn't talking to people that had no knowledge or comprehension of theology, but he equally lived a life that was obviously um, sacrificial. He was in prison, he was beaten. All those things were a witness to those outside the, the church, if you like. And then importantly in the quote, Philip, that you used, um, they came to him. He preached to those who came to him. And I think this is what it's about. Our works build relationship. Our works give an impression. People become curious. They then come and speak to us. We then have to have the right words to use to convey precisely what we mean. Um, so there, that's what I have to say. I've thrown that out. People can do with it what they will. <laughs> Thank you. That's very useful, man. Thank you. Um, Kevin. <clears throat> yeah, I found it. I found what uh, the two speakers, Philip and 
Chad had to say very interesting, and also liked what uh, Belangil just said. The one thing I thought that was quite interesting at the beginning when um, Chad spoke was about how society was moving away from God. And I would like to sort of um, define society as being those people both in the church or in a religious setting and those people outside. So I think it applies to every, you know, it applies across the board. I don't think it's uh, one can say, oh, I go to church and so I'm close to God. You know, I think there's more to it than that. The other thing that I found interesting was like when we're talking about words and actions, nobody, I didn't hear anybody talking about the heart, about the soul. And for me, I would say that words and actions are really expression of the same thing. I would say that, you know, um, it's like watercolour and oil. You can paint in watercolour, you can paint in oil. They're different mediums as an illustration. And I think that they're both expressions of language. And I think that your actions can express something and your words can express something. And I think you can use, you know, that one can follow the other or one can go before the other, one can do it without words, one can do it without actions, you know, I think, but they are an expression. And I think that, you know, when it's not connected with our souls, with our hearts, then both words and actions are empty. And when one follows Christ, whether knowingly or unknowingly, when one follows or does the things, whether you know it or not know it, you know, that he's given us in his um, testament, in, his, in the Gospels, then I think that you, you know, and if you do it out of what is in your heart, out of you're reaching out to people, to really to God. And somebody said about liking people. And I think, or loving people, I think what you have to love is you have to love God. I think that's the first thing. Because when you love God, because people are pretty awful, generally. <laughs> Otherwise, we wouldn't have wars and people wouldn't steal things like my phone the other day. You know, so, but I think that when you love God and God made us all, then in our imperfections, you see God. And in loving God, you then can build a relationship uh, with people. So I would turn around and say that actions and words are expressions, are languages. You know, they are languages for what is inside us. And you can have empty words, in which case you can say things which are not connected with your soul. You can do things which are not connected with your soul. They can be empty. Or you can do things which are an expression of what is inside. And I think that that is the, um, the point behind everything. Thank you, to say. Thank you, Kevin. Um, okay, so we've had uh, Melanda saying, don't forget relationships, building relationships, uh, to dispose uh, people to observe and to hear and to, re and to respond to you and to God. We've had Kevin saying that all of this, whether it's words or deeds, I like the thing about all colours and watercolours. That's very something I shall tuck under my hat for future use with your uh, copyright permission, Kevin. And then it must all come out of a heart that is, uh, to quote Phil and, and Wesley before, a heart that's on fire, you know, um, because 
I think this idea of fire is patristic. It goes back to the fathers of the Egyptian desert. Abba Joseph, Abba Lot, you know, all the answer, if you will, you can become all fire. You know, Wesley wasn't the first to say that. He had a great love, of course, for uh, the Macarian hom homilies and uh, knew the fathers of the desert. Maybe he. this is where the resonance came from. Pascal, I quoted this in my sermon on Sunday, Blaise Pascal, mathematician, you know, was found in, sewn inside his coat after his death. And he was a mathematician, brilliant mathematician. He said, not the God of uh, the philosophers, but the God of Abraham, Isaac and Japheth. And then there was just one word, fire, you know, unless, but there is a fire that warms and there's also a fire that consumes. And there are words that warm or there are words that consume. There are actions that warm, but there are also actions that consume. And this the necessity, this is my contribution, the necessity of distinguishing between warmth and incineration is the difference between um, transformation and fanaticism. Because there can be a fanatic fanaticism of actions, which arguably could be the communist project in Russia at least, and a fanaticism of words, which leads to all sorts of repressions. Um, the idea that there are some things that you can say and you cannot say. Now, of course, there are also things that we should not say because they're uh, infl inflammatory, using the fire language again. But it must be words or actions from the heart that warm other people, uh, but not just spiritually and mentally and emotionally, but also physically. I'm mindful of one quote that could have been used, which I will put before you, which undoubtedly um, William Booth said, is that you can't preach to someone on an empty stomach. Right, over to the rest of the comments on what's already been said or your own comments. Father, can you hear me? Yeah, crystal clear, Christopher. Excellent. So it's interesting. I've got a lot from every speaker that we've had so far. Um, but really a comment about actions, um, and I think of Father Stephen uh, down in uh, Norfolk, who, um, as, as I believe it, um, had a, or has, a market stall selling icons and, um, and just acting as a, as a contact point for people going about their everyday business and suddenly coming upon his stall. And, and that effort has led to a church built from scratch, you know, a church building built from scratch. Yeah. And, and I think that's inspirational. Um, the, and, and also uh, someone that I know you have um, immense um, regard for, um, uh, St. Nicholas of Japan who spent, was it, 30 years in Japan before he even opened his mouth about God. Um, and the... A bit, a bit shorter than that, but yeah, take your point. Yeah, yeah. So, and then there's, um, I, I heard, uh, I, I, I don't think this is a, apocryphal, or, but um, someone went to buy a crucifix and they were asked by the young person in the shop, in the jewellers, whether they wanted one with a little man on it. So we, I, I really believe that we've lost the language, uh, that the words, the vocabulary in this country, and that we need to uh, start with actions so that people can take notice or can begin the process of um, understanding. You, you almost need a hook for, for, to go on. And, um, you know, again, St. Paul in Athens, when he saw the temple to the unknown God, that was his little hook for um, getting people to listen to him. So, yes, um, words are good, but you also need... Um, actions and whether it's feeding somebody or whether it's um, just being somebody in the community that people know or trust or um, have have something 
that they think, oh yeah, okay, so that that's quite good that you know they have a a, a lunch club on a Wednesday afternoon or something. So it, it's um, uh, uh, it's difficult, isn't it, really? Because I think first of all there is the gap in the um, the vocabulary in in the UK. Um, we've lost that. And you can't go to, I, th I think Father Stephen would have had less success if he just stood in the street corner or, or in the market square um, uh, preaching. Um, but by doing his stall, uh, I think that was more successful. So again, more action to begin with and words come afterwards. Well, it was thus with St. Augustine. They came and they lived in Kent, um, just quietly amongst the community before they started doing anything. It was ever thus, I think. Mm. Mm. Anyone else, perhaps, who hasn't spoken so far? I I've spoken already, obviously, but I've something that Kevin said struck a chord with me, which I'd like to respond to if that's all right, Father Gregory. Of course. Um, I really liked what Kevin said about the heart. And um, I think I would like to think that was implicit in what Chad and I were saying, uh, even though we didn't explicitly mention it. I mean, to use another Wesley quote, my heart was strangely warmed. Uh, and you're know, picking up the fire image that Father Gregory used. But I think the, the issue, I think it's, it is interesting. I think I, I really like the, idea, um, the story that Chris said about the stall and, and the physicality of that in terms of presence. And, you know, St. Augustine, as Melangas has uh, reminded us, um, that sense of presence and being in a place and building relationships. But I think that the issue about the temple, you know, what comes first, words or, or actions or words, or uh, I'm not sure it really matters that much what the actual order is, as long as there's integrity and a matching between our words and our actions. And that's what we've got to aim for. And that will take a lifetime of discipleship. You know, at that point where our actions and our words marry up. I mean, Jesus exemplified that perfectly. The rest of us don't. But, you know, where our actions and our words match each other. And I think that's when people take notice i think there is a one uh, issue which could become contentious it won't be amongst ourselves i'm sure but which is contentious in the hands of others perhaps is that whether there is a responsibility of christians to speak truth to power when it will then become an issue of us being political for example, the Archbishop of Canterbury recently <coughs> has made it quite clear that the government's proposed system of having people go to Rwanda in order to make asylum applications is just unacceptable. Indeed, the European Court of Human Rights has recently judged that it is not licit legal internationally. And of course, the Home Office is contesting that. But that is a good example of a Christian leader making a statement about an, uh, what he regards to be an unethical practice. Uh, I would regard it to be an unethical practice as well. Uh, others might here might disagree. But this is an example of speaking truth to power. Uh, but following on from what you said, Phil, any church that was prepared to say that to a, a government in power must also be a church that actually works practically for mm. asylum seekers and provides mm. for their needs and makes sure that the community education follows that in order that pe we might be seen to be, without being easy prey to those who manipulate, um, a country that welcomes those who are dispossessed, welcome the stranger, I, I think, is it Leviticus? It's either Leviticus or Deuteronomy in which the Mosaic um, uh, Torah tradition makes it clear that welcoming the stranger is an integral part of what it is to believe in God. And it's something that we've been committed to at St. Aidan's for many years. So speaking truth to power, folks, last three minutes, does that make you feel uncomfortable or, you know, it's a necessary thing on or you know the danger that 
Christians then might be seen to be partisan politically. There we are, three minutes to throw that one around. I think you just need to look at um, Patriarch Kirill to, uh, to see the, his um, silence uh, or he's not condemning the uh, action in Ukraine is, is an example of uh, the church not speaking truth to uh, politicians. Mm. Yeah. Melangeth's got a hand up again. Melangeth, sorry, Melangeth. The little That's hand. Right. <laughs> um, uh, yes, I think it's important how one does it. And I think if, to be vociferous uh, perhaps is not the best way forward. I mean, it brought to mind what you were saying is, for instance, people who are pro-life and we are pro-life. Pro um, if we go to be pro-life, we then have to offer, for instance, women an alternative to abortion. We have to put our money where mm. our mouth is. Mm. We have to say, okay, I will stand beside you and support you through your pregnancy and the upbringing of your child as a single parent or as a family that's struggling or if the child is disabled or whatever. You know, we, we actually, in all these circumstances, if we're going to preach one thing, we have to stand by what we're saying in support of others. I mean, I, I have a, 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 an example of this from my own family. My sister was a member of the Dutch Reformed Church which teach, taught very strict morals and her children were young and they were listening to all this and her behavior at the time didn't match up to the words that were being spoken and now none of them will enter a church. And you know, this, th we have to be really careful of this. None of us are perfect, okay? But we have to, as I can't remember, I think it might've been Phil was saying or someone else was saying, we have to match our actions with our words and our words with our actions. I think Be it politically Malanga, or in any other way. Thank you, Malanga. That is an excellent uh, point for which we should close. And I think that we would all agree that our words must meet, meet our actions, match our actions. And to follow up from what Kevin said, must come from a heart that is on fire with the love of God. So I think we can all agree with that. Now, um, this is happening once a month, folks. OK, because I would like to persevere with this debate format for a while, because I think that it does structure our thinking and it particularly brings into the arena of discussion amongst Christians and Orthodox Christians specifically um, contrasting views. And I think this is important that the speakers, wherever possible, are not ordained persons because it alters the dynamic of what's going on because sometimes some people, sadly, will feel it less acceptable to contradict a priest than they would uh, someone else. So I think that's the way I would like to, at least for this, as much of this year as possible, continue. We won't meet in August, but I do propose that we meet in July, and I have a topic for you, because it's one that is contentious in the Orthodox Church, and I think this next one is going to have a double focus of what we do in the Orthodox Church, but also the wider aspect within uh, the Christian churches more generally, and that is, pause, ecumenism. Now, in many churches, this is not a contentious issue, but in the Orthodox Church, it is. Um, a lot of Orthodox churches have been very active in the World Council of Churches and the theologians and practical workers have been working with the communities. And this is an, a, an accepted and an important part of the work of the Orthodox communities. However, for other Orthodox voices, and these have been growing in strength in the last 10 to 20 years, ecumenical involvement is seen in some way to compromise uh, the distinctiveness of all Christian traditions, not just those of orthodoxy, by relativizing them to some sort of lowest common denominator. Now, you know, these, this is a contentious issue. It might be a non-issue for many other Christians, but for orthodox Christians, for some at least, it is a contentious issue. And I think that it's one that we need to address. So I'm going to seek out, um, 
two people not ordained who are orthodox who will speak to the proposition that ecumenical involvement and engagement in the Orthodox Church is a vitally necessary work, and the other point of view will be that it is a work that compromises uh, the integrity of participating churches and leads to confusion amongst the faithful of all traditions. So, or something like this. I mean, I've not yet worked out the proposal, but I think that will be an interesting one. We're going to have it either on Tuesday the 19th, hopefully, or the 26th of July. Some of you may be away on holidays uh, at that time, but we'll do our best to accommodate all. Does anybody have any advanced plans for those two Tuesdays? No, okay. Right, so I will be in touch about that. I put out an all points bulletin uh, on my Facebook time feed uh, timeline for people to speak against uh, ecumenical engagement in the Orthodox churches, because I don't think it's going to be very difficult to find people who speak in favour of it. So there we go. If you've got ideas about that, or you would like to present a case yourself, either for or against, please contact me. Thank you to all our listeners, our viewers on Facebook, on YouTube, or in any other kind of media. Uh, please do subscribe to my YouTube channel. Please consider that um, to be up to date with the kind of discussions that are going on in and around the Orthodox Church and in, uh, in our parish and in others. Thank you very much, everybody. God bless you. Um, pray for us all in this period after Pentecost when we remember the Holy Ones. Thank you, everybody. Good night and God bless. I will end the meeting. Bye-bye for now. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Chad. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Closing down now.